I'm going to talk about <clears throat> uh, demographic change and generational equity. Um, and demographic change is a drama in slow motion. It unfolds incrementally, tick by tock, but it transforms societies in fundamental ways. And our country is undergoing two vivid dramas, even as we speak. Uh, we are en route to becoming a majority non-white country. At the same time, a record share of us are going gray. Either one of these changes would be by itself the defining demographic story of its era. The fact that they are both happening at the same time has created generation gaps that have the potential to put a lot of stress on our families, uh, on, our, on our pocketbooks, on our social safety net and entitlement programs, uh, indeed on our social cohesion. And, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. But uh, let, let me first talk about the demographic change a bit, those two changes. And the paradox of demographic change is, even though it happens all around us, sometimes it's, it is hard to see. Nobody calls a press conference. Nobody blows a bugle and says, aha, we're getting older, or aha, you know, we, we, are, we are changing our complexion. But we do have these, uh, we do have these aha moments. And uh, uh, the one that the book opens with uh, was on the night of President Obama's re-election victory in 2012. Some of you, I'm a former political reporter. I was watching intently, channel flipping, 11 o'clock, 11.15. I happened to be watching Fox. And uh, the word came in that Ohio had now gone over into Obama. And that put him, uh, that put him over 270. And, and the Fox News anchor called the election you know, for Obama. Standing ne uh, sitting next to her was Karl Rove. Some of you may know the, uh, the Republican strategist. And, and it was a very unusual TV moment on election night. He said, no, 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 you, you, you're calling it too fast. There are still 20% of the precincts out. I know Ohio, you know, they're blah, 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 blah. And it, it was a little bit embarrassing. And she finally marched him back to the hermetically sealed uh, decision desk where all the numbers crunchers were there. And they, this was a live camera. And you rarely see moments like this. And they talked to the numbers crunchers. And they said, no, no, there's a 99.998% chance. Yes, we know there are 20% of the precincts out. But what fascinated me, because I know Karl Rove, I cover folks like this, is they will spin the election and what's likely to happen you know, 12 ways from Sunday up until election day because they want to get some advantage of, of do you thinking it's going to go their way. They don't really want to be wrong at 11 o'clock on election night. And he, there was something that he didn't see. He knows the numbers as well as anybody in the country. He, he didn't think Obama was going to win. You know, and if you remember, Obama had presided over an economy. At that point, there was 9 10% unemployment. Uh, a lot of the experts didn't think Obama was going to win. They, there was something that they didn't see, they didn't absorb. A second aha moment that, had it happened early enough, I would have led the book with, happened three months ago, uh, Super Bowl. One of the ways our society has changed is Super Bowl has, among other things, become a Super Bowl for political advertising. And the advertisers take a great deal of attention to the messages they will convey, and they roll them out on Super Bowl Sunday. And three of our most iconic brands, uh, Chevy, Cheerios, and Coke, had really striking messages. And they all had, they all had TV ad families. Now, somebody my age has been looking at TV ad families all his life. And I don't know what a TV ad family looks like. And among other things, the parents of a TV ad family are the same race and the opposite sex. Those have sort of been the rules. Well, here were three ads. Cheerios had an interracial couple. Coca-Cola had talked about the new us. And they said, you know, while, fa while families have changed, what it means to be a family has remained the same. And they had uh, same-sex couples. And Coca-Cola had six, a montage of six or eight Americans of all shapes, colors, and hues singing America the Beautiful in six or eight different languages. And they were all feel-good ads. Um, they got some blowback. All those advertisers surely knew they were going to get blowback. Indeed, the Cheerios ad, the first version of the Cheerios ad had run six months before. That was the one with the interracial couple uh, and, a, and an adorable little mocha-colored five-year-old daughter. And uh, it, it ran. It got so much blowback in the Twitter sphere and in the uh, conservative precincts of the traditional media that ultimately they took the comment section down from YouTube. But then they decided six months later, in this very uh, high-profile moment, to come back with a, with a repeat version of that ad. 
Listen, they, they, these, these folks aren't in the business of making political statements. They're certainly not in the business of making political enemies, not when they're spending $4 million for 30 seconds to project their images. So what, what did they see that Karl Rove didn't see, and what do they understand about who we are becoming? Well, what they see, and I, you know, I have my charts that can show you this, is in 1960, we were a country, our population was 85% white. By 2060, our population will be 43% white. And now, you know, I've given a version of this speech in, in many different places now around the country. That's, that is a kind of a whoa moment for most people. It is not a whoa moment for California because, because you're there, you, you know, and, and, and you, you are the future, and, and, but this is where the rest of the country is going. And as you know, uh, what is driving this change is our modern immigration wave, the, uh, which, uh, which is now 40 or 50 years old. It began in 1965 with legislation that opened our borders back up, our borders having been closed in the early 20s in reaction to the earlier immigration waves, and at some point all immigration waves uh, uh, produce backlashes, and, and uh, we've had our share of backlashes over the years. The first two immigration waves to this country are, you know, start in the, in the mid 18th and 19th century and go to the early 20th century. And the, the first big wave is from Western and, and Northern Europe. And the second big wave is from Southern and Eastern Europe. And together, those two waves bring about 32 million Americans and 90% of them from Europe. Then immigration, for all intents and purposes, it stops for about four decades. It starts again in 1965, and since then, we have brought more than 40 million Americans uh, you know, to our shores. So it's more than the first two combined, although our population is bigger, so as a share of the population, it is not quite as big. Uh, but only 12% of the modern immigration wave is from Europe, about half is from Latin America, about 30% is from Asia, and indeed, if you just look at the last four or five years, more from Asia than from Latin America. So it is, it is taking, it is changing our racial tapestry. It's making our racial tapestry actually much more complex and much more interesting. And one of the interesting questions is, so when you project forward to that 2060, you're 43 percent white. Based on current trends and demography is sort of the future we already know. A lot of this is baked in. You, you do a plus or minus margin of error because some things change, but these sorts of things don't change that much. So about 43 percent white, about 30 percent Hispanic. Uh, eight or eight or nine percent Asian, thirteen percent black. It becomes a very rich uh, texture. Uh, and there's another thing uh, that we need to think about: is whether those very labels that I've just described by the middle of this century will even make much sense. Because <clears throat> today, about fifteen percent of all marriages are across racial and ethnic lines. And among our new immigrants, more than a quarter, uh, you know, among Asians and, um, and Hispanics, more than a quarter are marrying across racial boundaries. When Barack Obama's parents were married in Hawaii in 1961, our best estimate is that one-tenth of one percent of marriages were like his parents' marriage, a, between a black person and a white person. It was still illegal in about a third of the, uh, of the country. It was gasp-inducing taboo everywhere else. Now it has become more commonplace, and, 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 and you know, our old vocabulary really is having trouble keeping up with our new weddings. I mean, what are we going to call the kids of these marriages? Will we still use those four racial uh, categorization schemes? Well, what do we call the President of the United States? The Pew Research Center asked a question shortly after he was elected. Oh, what do you think of Barack Obama? you think of him mainly as a black person or mainly as a mixed race person? Most whites said mainly mixed race. Most blacks said mainly black. But a, but a significant minority of each group had it the other way. Obama himself uh, had a fill out his 2010 census form, and he said he was a black person. And he got a little blowback from people who want the mixed race identification to, to be more fully embraced, for people to sort of own all of the bloodstreams of who they are. And he, in effect, said, look, I'm, my name is Barack Obama. I look like myself. I grew up in the United States in the late 20th century. I'm a black guy, who are we kidding? And I, I, I think most people sort of get that. But I do think that this, this, is, this is one of the interesting challenges and the dynamism that comes from our immigration waves, not just in terms of replenishing our workforce and ultimately making us younger and more productive, but also making us more diverse in a world that's getting even, even smaller is, is one of the great demographic strengths that we have. It's absolutely a great strength. So at the same time, <coughs> we are changing our complexion we are going gray. I'm a baby boomer. Uh, I turned 65 last two months ago now. Um, today, 
10,000 other baby boomers will turn 65. Tomorrow, 10,000 more will turn 65. And the next day, and on and on. And this goes on every single day until the year 2030. At which point, we will have an age pyramid, the likes of which we have never seen before. And the one thing I wish I did have for my animated slide is uh, demographers like to divide the, the population of a country up into pyramids, and each of our horizontal bar is a five-year cohort, and in every country in human history, you know, the, the bottom bar, zero to four, is always the biggest, and then, and, then, and then five to nine, and on and on it goes, and it always is a pyramid up to 85 and over. It goes like this. Well, by the time the baby boomers all cross the threshold of 65, it won't be a pyramid anymore. It'll be a rectangle. There will be as many people 65, 85 and over you know, as, as zero to four. Uncharted war waters in human history. A lot of this is a good news story. This, uh, this is the story of increased longevity. What's not to like about that? It's the story of declining birth rates. If you're worried about fossil fuels and the, uh, fuels and the sustainability of the Earth's resources, what's not to like about that? This is not just an American story. This is a global story. Our population of seniors is going to double by mid-century. The world's population of seniors is going to double by mid-century. To, six, to, to a billion. Indeed, uh, the current issue of The Economist magazine has a cover story called A Billion Shades of Grey, and, and it is about the aging of the population, and it is about uh, sort of the rich and poor and, and the haves and have-nots among the older, the older group. So this is happening all over, and indeed, it, 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 as we become, as I say, a rectangle, which is, which is, again, is uncharted waters in human history, a lot of our biggest economic competitors, actually, they don't quite become an inverted pyramid, but for those of you, for those of you who remember your high school geometry, they, they become a top-heavy trapezoid. So for example, Germany and China have more people up top than at bottom. Japan is un, in unprecedented territory. A, lo a lot of this is the extraordinarily low birth rates in Japan almost no immigration, and they have, and this, <coughs> this creates challenges. Again, there's a lot to like about these demographic changes, but let's not kid ourselves, there are challenges. Um, and the challenge, uh, in, a, in a fiscal sense, uh, and in a social cohesion sense, is you have fewer people working and paying taxes to support more people who are older and drawing on uh, the social safety net that we created. Uh, so th the challenge is to rebalance those programs in a way that keeps faith with the promises we've made to the old without bankrupting the young and starving the future. And this is not going to be easy. And uh, you know it in California, there's a version of this, and we were just talking about this uh, in the minutes before the session, uh, around some, some, of the, uh, some of the public employee pensions and, and whether or not we can, this state can support them. And if they support them, is, that the, is it at the expense of basic public services or investments that will protect the future? So let me talk a little bit about the generation gaps created by the demographic changes I've, I've described, then talk a little bit about this, this specific challenge, and then I hope take your questions. So because of these overlapping generation gaps, we now have a public uh, where old and young uh, don't look alike, they don't think alike, and they don't vote alike. Uh, and this, this, too, is very unusual. Uh, it, you only have to go back to the year 2000, the, the, the famous toy costs election between uh, Al Gore and George Bush, uh, where if you look, and it was a kind of a, as we all remember, it was, a raise, it was an even split election. There were only, what, a couple of thousand votes separating the two. And if you look at how old and young voted in 2000, there was virtually no difference. Uh, it was 50-50 among the young, it was 50-50 among the old. And if you look at most of the elections in the uh, 80s, 90s, and early aughts, virtually no difference in the voting patterns between young and old. <clears throat> if you look now at the last three presidential elections, the two that Barack Obama was involved in and the one before that between uh, Bush running for re-election and John Kerry, there is a very large gap that has opened up between the young who are the transitional generation now. They are the next America, and they're now aging into the workforce and into the electorate. So we're on our way to a, a, a national public that's 50% uh, more than half non-white. Uh, this generation is, is the most non-white of any generation in our history. More than 40% of the so-called millennials, 18 to 34-year-olds, are non-white. Whereas the older generation, my generation, I'm an older boomer, and the, the generation above that is called the silent generation, 8 in 10 are white. 
So you've got, you've got a racial difference, and it plays out in a familiar political difference where the older and whiter group tends to be more conservative, but boy, hands off Social Security and Medicare. The younger generation is very socially and politically liberal. So one of the reasons why the Cokes and the Cheerios um, uh, and the Chevys want to show that they understand that the makeup of families is changing, that people's relationships are changing. And by the way, there was another moment, I don't know how many of you were sports fans, uh, just, just uh, uh, two days ago where Michael Sam, the, the openly gay uh, college player, was finally drafted uh, late. And there was a really interesting moment on ESPN where they showed him receiving the news and giving a full-on embrace and kiss to his male partner. Now, we're accustomed to seeing the celebratory moment when a college athlete gets the great news and hugs his girlfriend, kisses his girlfriend, his wife, his mother, whatever. I don't think we've seen this before. And, and again, I, I, you know, it got some blowback in the Twitter sphere. There's no question that this is, to a lot of folks, an excuse old, is, whoa, whoa, I didn't sign up for this. Where are we all going here? But we're going there. And, and, in, and in the case of our social uh, and, po and political values, it really is the young leading the old. <clears throat> On the other hand, in the case of the economic circumstances, the story is very different. And if you start with the young generation, the millennials, again, they're 18, they're 18 to 34. And so, frankly, a lot of them are now old enough <laughs> that they're presumably through their education, uh, and they're into the, uh, the, the stage of the life cycle where you become an adult, and you do the things that adults do. What do you do? You find a job, you find a, you find a marriage partner, you get married, you buy a house, you have a family, you buy a car, all of the above. And every single one of those classic milestones of adulthood, millennials are five, seven, eight years behind their parents' generation. Uh, and is it because they're slow-witted? No, no, it, it is because they have inherited an economy that is much, much more hostile to, just, to anyone just starting out in life than any economy we've known probably since the Great Depression. And we, we know the story of the very tough economy of, of five or six years ago, and we're allegedly in this recovery, and we've been allegedly in this recovery been for five years now, but we know it's a recovery that has bypassed most Americans, and we know there is a story of rich and poor, uh, you know, an income inequality that is growing. Less, less well understood, but right there in the middle of this story is the story of young and old. The young are having a terrible time getting started. Uh, and whether, whether, it's the, whether it's the globalization of labor markets, uh, whether it's the digital revolution that has been good to some but not good to all, uh, pick, uh, whether it's the decline of labor unions, you, you pick, pick your theory. Uh, whether it's the collapse of the housing market, and any indicator you look at, and again, the Pew Research Center are in the business of looking at these numbers a lot. So if you look at employment, unemployment, uh, average wages, um, uh, wealth, poverty, debt, every single one of those kind of classic indicators of well-being, and you compare that generation of young adults, uh, we, we looked at 25 to 32 year olds because we wanted to catch people after presumably most were through with their formal education. And we compared them with their same age cohorts a generation and two generations ago. And you do the corrections for inflation and all the rest. So it's an apples to apples comparison. This generation is doing worse on, <clears throat> on every single one of them. It's also true in this generation, by the way, that the income gaps within the generation are larger than they've ever been. So we know the story, and I imagine uh, an audience like this is very familiar with the story of those 25 to 33-year-olds who went to college, got a degree. Uh, many of them came away with student loan debt, and, and you know the debt, the debt levels are double what they had been a generation before, again, after adjusting for inflation. And the number of students with debt is up extraordinarily. So that story is well told. Perhaps less well known is that for a college student ages 25 to 33, the unemployment rate is 3.8%. For someone who only went to high school or less, it's 12%. So whatever the economic challenges are, and certainly the albatross of having starting your life with student loan debt um, uh, is a big one, uh, it is much worse for those who don't go beyond, because in a knowledge-based economy, the penalties for not going, the only thing more important, the only thing more expensive than going to college these days is not going to college. Uh, and a lot of young adults have discovered that. Uh, so these young adults 
who are who are not you know who are saddled with debt, having trouble finding jobs. 40, 50 percent of them, at some point in their young lives, have either never left home or have boomeranged back at some point to live with mom and dad. That turns out to be a good place to hang out when you can't get started, and you know the refrigerator is usually stocked, and you don't have to put coins into the washing machine, um, uh, and uh, and very very few of them are married. Uh, so. Uh, among, among 18 to 33 year olds today, 26% <clears throat> are married. Among 18 to 26 year olds, when I was that age, uh, um, uh, among 18 to 32 year olds, when I was that age, more than half were married, one generation up, two thirds were married. So they're very slow to what, what, what somebody my age would say are the traditional milestones of marriage. Um, and when we, the Pew Research Center, asked young adults, you wanna get married, uh, those who are not married, the great majority say yes, and then we have a question, well, why not? What's holding you back? And I'm paraphrasing here, we don't quite phrase it this way, but in effect they say, well, look at me. <laughs> I don't have a job, I don't have good career prospects, I can't be a good provider, you know, I'm not ready yet. So marriage tends to happen later after people have finally got that, uh, got that all worked out. Um, so that, that, that is a, a challenge going forward is when we think about this generation, you know, one of the, one of the great uh, dreams of America and the, uh, the tenet of the American idea is that it, it always gets better one generation to the next. Um, and right now, uh, it is not clear it's gonna get better for this next generation. Indeed, if you ask Americans today, and again, we do these sorts of polls, do you think today's young will do better about as well or worse you know, in their lives than the current generation. The Americans are very optimistic and they very much believe in the idea of progress and that's who we are as a people. But we're starting to see now for the first time a majority of Americans say, no, 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 I, I, it doesn't look to us like the next generation will do better. Now, I, I, will, I will say that when you ask them, well, what about your own children? Will they do better than you? Then, then the optimism does kick in. Most people say, yes, my own kids are gonna do better than me. And by the way, the most optimistic responses on both of those questions, will all, will all of today's young do better and will your kids do better, the most optimistic responses are among uh, immigrant groups and minority groups. Uh, and whether it's, whether it's some of those groups are, start, are at sort of still at the bottom and they say, of course it's gonna get better, I'm not setting the bar very high myself, or whether it is because they are immigrants, and immigrants have uh, perhaps you know, more of this notion of, of course it's gonna get better. By, my goodness, that's why I left, that's why I came here, to make sure it's gonna get better, and that is something that is precious and has always been part of who we are. Well, in order for it to get better, and, <coughs> and here we get into the, uh, the, the sort of closing few minutes on generational equity. In order for it to get better, uh, <coughs> Uh, we as a society uh, sort of owe the next generation a better deal than they are currently slated to get from the most important public policy and the most successful and the most popular public policy program, domestic public policy program we've ever created and that's called Social Security and with Medicare thrown in and all the rest. Um, right now those programs are on an unsustainable basis and Again, here is where uh, the, de the demography can give you the future you already know. There are, a, uh, there are a few little unknowables baked in here, but the Social Security trustees run all the numbers and they do their scenario planning. And again, they're dealing with a future that is mostly at this point baked in. And they can say that by a date certain, in the case of uh, Medicare, it's 2026. So that's only, what, 12 years from now? And Social Security is 2033, 19 years from now. These programs cannot meet the obligations they have made <coughs> to, uh, to, the, to the, the beneficiaries who will be able to lay claim to them at that point. And again, uh, uh, some of that is that age curve I talked about. So when the Social Security started 70, 80 years ago, you literally had 40 or 50 taxpayers per beneficiary. That, that, that's a feature of any brand new program. It matures and then you get down to 10 taxpayers per beneficiary and then about uh, 40 or 50 years ago, we're down to five. We're currently at about three and by the time all the boomers retire, it'll be two, there'll be two. And it just, the math just doesn't work. You can't, you can't get around it. Uh, the challenge we have as a political society is to recognize that 
and to take steps to mitigate it. Uh, and uh, the, there, the very simple formula is, uh, the sooner you do it, the longer you wait, the deeper the hole becomes, and the more the burden of any solution will fall on tomorrow's, today's young and tomorrow's retirees. The sooner you do it, the more you can do it gradually, the less painful it will be, and you can spread the pain among generations. And it seems to me the looming, the looming tragedy here is because this is not easy, and it, and it will result, and, and there are a couple of reasons it's not easy. One, Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and liberals don't agree on the way to solve the problem, and there's a Democratic solution and there's a Republican solution. That's one problem. And the second problem is politicians don't want to do anything on either side that's hard, and this is hard. And so there's a natural tendency to wait till the crisis comes, because it is still 10, 15 years down the road. But all you're doing every day you wait is digging tomorrow's Americans into a, into a deeper hole. And that, that, gets, that gets to kind of the moral issue here. And this is an issue uh, that ph philosophers of democracy have thought about from the earliest days. So if you go back to Plato, for example, um, you know, and he talks about one of, one of the challenges of democracy is that citizens tend to want to live from day to day, uh, indulging in the pleasures of the moment, and, and they don't want to worry about tomorrow, and they don't want their elected leaders to worry about tomorrow, because again, that's tough. Our great founding political philosopher, uh, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, had an exchange where Thomas Jefferson is, is probably the most famous line in his writings, uh, you, know, other, uh, you know, other than the Declaration of Independence, where Jefferson says, you know, the earth belongs to the living, not the dead, and by which he meant that, that you, you can't have a democracy where the dead, where people, where one generation encumbers the next generation. And, and in fact, he suggested that every law that's passed, including the Constitution itself, naturally automatically expire within the span of a generation, just, just to restrain the instincts of one generation to, to impose burdens on another generation. Well, that, that never flew. But that same, that same instinct has been part of a political challenge, and indeed the father of the current social safety net, and I would argue the genius father of the current social safety net, Franklin Roosevelt saw this problem and wanted Social Security and Medicare to be a contributory, pre-funded program, somewhat similar to a, the kinds of pensions that, we all, that some of us used to have. Those, those old-fashioned pensions are going away, but he has a famous line as they were arguing about how to structure Social Security in the 1930s. This was in the midst of the Great Depression. We, were, we as a society were a little bit late to creating a public safety net for older folks. Um, uh, Germany and G uh, Great Britain had done it decades before. We, we have always been a little reluctant. We're a self-reliant people. We're a little bit skeptical of what is deemed to be welfare programs. Roosevelt understood that, and his sense was, let, listen, let's, the public can't see this as a welfare program. If they do, it will never go anywhere. It will never have popular legitimacy. It needs to be seen as an earned benefit program. So we put those contributions in there, he says, and those are the FICA taxes, the Social Security and Medicare taxes that all of us pay, everybody who works pays, pays on our first dollar that we earn. Put them in there so that, so that the, the eventual beneficiaries would have a legal and moral and political right to claim them, and no damn politician could ever take, you know, get rid of my Social Security system. Well, he, you know, 70, 80 years later, he was right. Social Security is our biggest federal program, it's our biggest taxing program, it's our biggest benefit program, it's our most muscular anti-poverty program, although people don't think of it that way. If we didn't have Social Security, nearly half of our seniors would be poor. Because we have Social Security and Medicare, only about 10 percent of our seniors are poor. You go back to Roosevelt's day, the poorest Americans far and away were older Americans. Today, the poorest Americans far away are younger Americans. Those young adults I talked about and their kids are now the poorest Americans. Because unfortunately, uh, the, the, the idea of a pre-funded contributory program didn't quite survive uh, the, 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 political, uh, you know, the political machinations of the following decades. Uh, so we, it's, it's now much more a pay-as-you-go program. It's already in arrears year to year. We did build up some, some, uh, some surpluses, but they're being chipped away at. And when I would said that in 12, 15, 18 years, they'll be gone, and at that point, the programs will only be able to pay about 
three quarters of promised benefits. Young adults know this. We, we did a survey of everybody and said, you know, do you think when you're, when you're ready to retire, will Social Security be there for you at current levels, at reduced levels? Not at all. Among the millennial generation, 50% uh, said it won't be there at all. 40% said it will be there, but at reduced levels, just 6% said it will be there for me at current levels. So there is a recognition of this. Interestingly, young adults don't want the program benefits cut because they understand how important they are to their parents or their grandparents. And one of the things that when people talk about this issue, they sometimes say, we are headed for a generation war here. The math doesn't work. We've got to rebalance it. We know old folks are very good at protecting their interests. They vote a lot. They, they, they have the money. They have the political clout. And there's going to be, at some point, a big war. One of the things we find when we do our surveys is a war needs combatants, and there's very little evidence that young and old are spoiling for a fight over this. I speak as a boomer who came of age in the 60s when there was a lot of cultural and social and political turbulence. And there was kind of a whiff of generation war. And, and my generation kind of had an accusatory finger pointed at our parents and grandparents. We sort of said, you guys screwed everything up. Thank God we're here to make it right. Um, these, these kids don't, don't look at their parents, and I would say us, that way at all. They know that they've gotten the raw end of the stick uh, on their economic circumstances, uh, they, they're somewhat cynical about what government, government promises. They're somewhat, frankly, distrustful of institutions and other people. But they are not a conflictual generation. In some, in some ways, uh, the, uh, I would say the boomers and the older folks have sort of uh, gotten a, kind of a gift here that uh, maybe they didn't. Or, or, or maybe it was the parenting norms that raised them. But this is not a generation of young adults that's looking for a fight. But nonetheless, the numbers are very tough. And uh, what, uh, what it just, uh, the, the other way that they are being disadvantaged, not just by a very hostile economy, not just by a social safety net that's not going to work as well for them as it is for their parents and grandparents, but that safety net is consuming more and more and more of our federal budget. Uh, and between Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, we know we're going to be within 10, 15, 20 years more than half of the federal budget, up from about a third today. This is not an argument to say that these programs need to be dismantled. I think they need, frankly, to be strengthened. And I think that there are ways they need to be strengthened. But it is one reason that explains why we are doing so less of the other things that we are, have been accustomed to doing as a society. And so you go back to the concerns of Plato and Jefferson. Will a democracy have the wisdom to invest in the future? And if you think about the great in public investments that this country has made over the centuries, whether it is the Intercontinental Railroad, or the Interstate Highway System, or the Internet, or the Erie Canal, or the Panama Canal, or the GI Bill, or the Marshall Plan, or on and on you could go. We actually have had the wisdom to think big thoughts uh, and to invest in the future and to invest in the prosperity of the next generation. At the moment, we are doing much less of that. And there may be a lot of reasons for that. And some of that may be our toxic and gridlock politics. And some of it may just be that these big programs are consuming so much of our budget that there's not enough left for anything else. But this is part, it seems to me, of the rebalancing that has to happen. And my final thought is that I hope that ultimately it is a people of my generation uh, that see this. And maybe as we get to this stage of the life cycle, uh, we, there's, a, there, there's an instinct, uh, you know, uh, as, as someone said, uh, humans are a species that are sort of designed to pass the torch. Uh, Eric Erickson, I am what survives of me. Our generation is, you know, is the beneficiary of all the sacrifices and all the investments that came before. We had a, we've had a pretty great run. It seems to me the next generation deserves uh, the same chance at prosperity that we had, and it will require hard choices, maybe some sacrifices, hard compromise in a, in a society that at the moment has lost its, lost its way for political compromise. But I hope my generation is part of the solution. And frankly, I see some young adults here. I hope it's the next generation. You know, the tick, tick, tick of generational change will bring more of young adults into the electorate. Presumably, their voices will be heard. And sooner or later, you know, we are much too much of a can-do country not to solve this problem. Uh, but let's try to solve it sooner rather than later. Thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you for those remarks, Paul. 
I suspect we could be here all evening with uh, questions on these topics, but we'll do our best in the 30 minutes we have. Uh, why don't we start with Disraeli's question about the middle class and apply it to millennials. Based on your research, who are they and what do they want? You know, it's a, it's a fascinating question. I would say the m millennials, the, the younger adults, are forging a very, very distinctive path into adulthood. And I describe some of the, their economic circumstances. Let me describe two or three other features of this generation that is distinctive. First of all, they, they are unmoored from institutions. Uh, I mentioned uh, you know, only 26% are married. That's only about half the share of older adults at the same time. They are, I mentioned they're a very democratic voting generation. They're very liberal in their social and political values. But when you ask them, uh, what are you, a Democrat, a Republican, or an independent, 50% say, I'm an independent. We, we, the Pew Research Center and other survey organizations, have never seen a cohort with that high a number of, of independents. We see a very sim similar phenomenon when we ask them, what religion are you? Again, it's a, and we ask this of adults of all ages, uh, you know, and it's a Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, Hindu. Uh, a record share of young adults in America say I have no particular religion. That doesn't necessarily mean they're atheist or agnostic. It simply means that they don't choose to affiliate with uh, the, 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 the kind of some of the anchor institutions of society. So what do they do? How do they affiliate? How do they navigate their lives? And of course, it's that little thing that we now all hold in our hands. So they are, they are the first generation of digital natives. Uh, and while I you know, I can now kind of catch up and try to do these things, you know, you know and, and with my jaw dropped as I do them. I mean, the idea that I am three clicks away from the sum of all human knowledge is utterly astonishing every day. And increasingly, if I have to make a third click, I'm thinking to myself, what's taking so long, you know? But, but they, for, for young adults, uh, this is not only their indispensable platform for all information acquisition, but it is their indispensable platform for all social interaction. <coughs> Somebody described them as the pre-Copernican generation. Those of you who remember your high school, uh, high school science. Uh, the, uh, the, the universe really can revolve around them because they can order, their, they can find their tribes, they can find their interest groups, uh, the people who share their interests, whether it's fantasy football or, 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 or whether, it's, uh, you know, whether it's this hobby or that hobby, or whether it's their friends. Uh, they, th those, uh, you know, on, they have 250 friends. Uh, the median millennial has 250 Facebook friends. The median person my age has about 40 Facebook friends. Discuss among yourselves, has there been a quantum leap in human friendliness, or is there just something different about the way young adults use these platforms? Well, of course that's the case, and the platforms really do become, uh, again, their platform for interaction. Um, whether, wh what kind of adult, what kind of adults they will become, whether they'll drift away from some of this, we know, we, we do these surveys all the time. A large share of millennials have at some point taken a break from Facebook, enough already, Facebook fatigue. But, there, but that competes with FOMO, as some of you may know that, which is fear of missing out. So a lot of these kids, you know, go to bed with, with these, these phones and everything right now because, my God, you know, they got 18 conversations going and something might, interesting might happen. Um, the other interesting thing about this generation, and my, this will be my last observation, is that they have um, low levels of social trust. Uh, so again, it's a classic survey question uh, that basically goes like this. Uh, generally speaking, would you say most people can be trusted or you can't be too careful when you're dealing with other people? So this generation of young adults, 19% only say most people can be trusted, which is much lower than older adults, and indeed lower than older adults back when they were age, the age millennials are now. Uh, there are a number of theories about this. Uh, a, the leading theory is, as I mentioned before, a, a disproportionately large share, at least compared to their elders, are minorities, and, and, and they're having a tough time economically. And we know in, in societies that, that uh, social trust correlates in a negative way with economic well-being. So people who are vulnerable in a society, for whatever reason, if they're a minority, if they're at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale, tend to have low levels of social trust because they're less well fortified to deal with the consequences of misplaced trust. Some of the lack of trust may be they look at the institutions of society, whether it's, frankly, it's all institutions of government. A lot of these kids voted for Barack Obama and believed that, that he was gonna represent a change in the way politics happens, and we can see from our numbers 
that some of that, some of that first love and there, there's some disillusionment there. Um, uh, but, it, but I would say that is a troubling, uh, that's a troubling aspect. Social trust at the end of the day in, in our kind of society, which moves very fast, which is very heterogeneous, at the end of the day, trust is sort of the grease that keeps the gears from grinding and keeps them uh, moving along. Um, uh, uh, another uh, plausible explanation for the low levels of trust is the parenting norms th that they were raised by. Uh, they were raised with very protective parenting norms and very encouraging parenting norms. Uh, th th this then also explains, for all that I've described, all their difficult economic circumstances, all their s s disillusionment, they are actually very optimistic. Again, I got surveys on this, and you ask people of all ages, do you think uh, do you think you currently have enough money to live, do you currently have enough money to live the life you want? Well, millennials say no, uh, and older adults say yes. Well, do you think you will eventually have enough money to live the life you want? And there, millennials are off the charts. Nearly 90% say, yep, and no other generation is nearly as confident looking into the future. So, again, discuss among yourselves, are they young and stupid, you know, and they just haven't lived very long, and, and they're invincible, and life will teach them, you know, a, a more sobering lesson? Or is it the empowerment they get from being able to place themselves at the center of their social networks and being told by their parents that they're precious and getting a trophy for trying very hard, and, you know, and 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 uh, and and those kinds of parenting. I, I you know, I, I'm throwing these out as possible explanations. I've talked too long. Anyway, I, 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 I will say, um, the, the the one thing I've run into is when I talk about the social media stuff, the selfies, you know, we also have a finding that nearly four in 10 millennials have, uh, have tattoos. So, you know, which, which, which is the kind of the offline equivalent, if you ask me, of a selfie. There, there is a look at me aspect to this generation. And I would say it is, it is uh, at the end of the day, based on the fact that they're the first generation in human history that has had the power to take a picture of itself, yourself, Put it online, you know, maybe your family will look at it, maybe your five best friends will look at it, but you know what? If it's a pretty interesting picture and that cat is really dancing, maybe, maybe five million people will look at it and, and never before in human history has, has everybody had a chance to do this. Um, so, uh, and I also think it, uh, the, the rap that they sometimes hear the, the saying as well, I'm calling them or others are calling them narcissistic, it's not a word I like to use, mostly because I sort of feel like when it comes to generations and narcissism, my generation retired the cup. We've been, we've been observing ourselves in our own way for our whole careers. Witness our name. We became famous just for being born. We're the baby boomers. And we certainly became came, famous as we came of age. Uh, and again, we had, we had protests, and I, I would argue a lot of what we protested needed protesting, and we've made America a, a better place. But boy, we did it with a lot of navel gazing along the way. Um, so anyway, I, I, I don't know. That's, uh, that's a too long answer to a fascinating question. A few uh, assertions and hypotheses from the audience with questions for your reaction. What explains the rise of house husbands and dads in the millennial generation, and what does this portend? One of, one of the most important changes, uh, you know, I think it's right up there with the digital revolution, you know, as a thing that has happened in our era, which, which is the movement of women into the workforce, uh, which began happening 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, it has been fueled now by the digital revolution creating a knowledge-based economy. And I hate to say this to my male, my male friends in the room, uh, you know, you know once, once it's not about who has a stronger back, but it's about brains, you know, we've got 30 years of evidence now, and it's not going well for the guys. Um, so, I mean, you, you guys know what, where the numbers are. I think, you know, at undergraduate, if you look at undergraduate populations uh, in colleges throughout the country, I think it's 58 or so percent now are women. It's a complete reverse from 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, gender roles are changing at work. Uh, they haven't completely equalized, but they're getting more equal, and gender roles have changed at home, getting to this question. So, we put out a report a few months ago uh, called uh, Breadwinner Mom. So today, 40% of all children in America, children under the age of, of 18, are being raised in a household where the woman, is, the mother, is either the sole or primary breadwinner. 
<laughs> much of that is the rise of single parenting, and we know that phenomenon, and that, and that is one of the most, in the opinion of the American public, uh, that's one of the most unfortunate developments of, of, of the past few generations, uh, the, the sharp rise in single mothers. But a lot of it is, is just, just what the question said, is a lot of it now is wives who out earn husbands. Uh, so of the 40 percent women who are the solar primary, you know, uh, you know, about uh, about 40 percent of them are, are not single. They they are wives out earning their husbands. I think uh, I think the male ego has had a little trouble dealing with this. There was a, when we did this report, there was a fascinating onion spoof of our report. Uh, I don't know if you see they, they, they and it and it. Uh, it, it, it was it was a quote it was a quote news piece a news feature about house husbands about the guys who are taking care of the kids while the high priced wife was out there earning a career and and the guys were just saying oh it's great I love it and you know and one guy, and they had quoted one guy says you know <clears throat> however if I if my wife ever gets the upper body strength to be able to twist off those hard to open jars. I'm out of my ass. <laughs> so uh, I, I, again, I, I think is w w women uh, are doing better than men in a knowledge-based uh, in a knowledge-based economy. Um, that would be my one-sentence answer. This one's a question about baby boomer motivations. Many corporate senior managers and executives are boomers, and we are seeing very low capital investments from the corporate sector. Are we seeing a conservatism and timidity about investing in people and capital from the boomers protecting what they have? Well, I don't know if it's the boomers protecting what they have, but I, but I think, you know, when I talked about the decline in public investments in the big things that make us a great country, you, I, I, you could make the same point about private investment. Uh, it is down as a share of GNP. It, it's measurably down, and you know the phenomena of a lot of the big companies sitting on a lot of cash. And I don't know whether that springs from uh, I got mine and I want to protect it, or it more. In, in my guess is, and again, I don't want to stretch my credentials here. I'm not an economist. My guess is it springs from all sectors of our economy, uh, a little bit uncertain about what to invest in. Uh, you know, the world is changing very, very fast. Uh, there, there is a worry. I have a worry about uh, about what our what our uh, job, what our labor force looks like, whether or not one of the things that the digital economy has done, it's destroyed a lot of jobs. Throughout human history, most technological revolutions <clears throat> destroy jobs, but at the end of the day, they create more jobs than they destroy. It's not clear to me that, it, it's certainly clear that hasn't happened this time. It may, I, I simply don't know, but uh, my sense is that things move so fast that it is difficult to know where to plunk down your big bets. Um, I don't know, may, you may be in a world that understands this better than I do. But I, I think, it's, I, to me, it seems to be a little bit rough to apply it to a particular selfishness uh, of a particular generation. I would say, though, uh, back to an area that I am more familiar with, which is public policy around Social Security and Medicare. <laughs> Again, if you look at the survey results by generation about who's willing to do what, what you find is, first of all, everybody wants to protect the programs. They are most, they are literally, you ask people of all ages, are these programs good for America? And 90% will say yes. We take a lot of surveys. We don't see a lot of 90%. You ask people, does your mother love you? I'm not sure we'll get 90% back. <laughs> these programs are extraordinarily successful and extraordinarily popular. <clears throat> but the people least willing to sort of take bites out of uh, current beneficiaries are, of course, current beneficiaries. So is there some protect my own, uh, you know, I paid for it, damn it, you know, uh, uh, and, and no one's taking it away from me. And, of course, that, that was the genius that, that Franklin Roosevelt built into the system. Unfortunately, uh, the reality is, and these numbers are so eye-popping when I throw them out, people can't get their mind around them. The, the reality is if you start today, and you look at everybody now who is getting Social Security and everybody who has ever gotten Social Security, and many of them now passed on to their greater rewards, but if you look at all recipients from today back to the beginning of the program, and you add up how much they paid, and you do a 2% over inflation you know, adjustment to how much that might earn, they've gotten back $18 trillion more than they put in. That's one reason why these programs are so popular. Uh, they, have, they have been great. Or they've been a great lifetime return on investment. Then if you look at all 
current people paying into the system and what they will get back, they will get back trillions of dollars less than they put in. So there is just simply a fundamental imbalance. And I think it's a little tough to call, it's not that the boomers created this imbalance or the 80 year olds created this imbalance, it's simply the way our political process works and sometimes doesn't work. And again, I go back to, we can see it, the actuaries can tell it to us, it's there to be solved, and we just need to summon the political will to solve it. Here's a question that may at least partially challenge that last assertion. If real wages were still rising at the same rate as labor productivity as they had until 1979, the Social Security Trust Fund would be solvent until 2075. How do we find a way to raise the opportunities and wages of the young and address the issue of income and wealth inequality? Boy, <laughs> different, different lecture. I would love to know the answer to that. Again, it's over, it's over my pay grade and beyond my understanding, but, 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 uh, uh, but it, is, it, it is an issue now that is appropriately getting the attention that it needs um, uh, because, uh, you, you know, you're absolutely right in this, this book, uh, Thomas uh, Piketty, that, you know, has made such an impression, makes, makes the point that this has always been a concern about capitalism. At, at, at some point, uh, you know, wealth will take care of itself uh, and it will not float down. And uh, we saw that in the late 19th century. Uh, it, it, we saw much less of it in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, and but Piketty's point is, but those were, that was that was a period of, of wage compression and declining inequality that he believes was the result of a couple of world wars and and some disruptions. Uh, but we may now be back to the more standard situation. So I'm not smart enough. No, that uh, uh, you know, it's there. I see it. Again, we do a lot of demographic and economic analyses. We look at a lot of census data. We're not always looking for, we're, and we're always looking for, we're always looking to slice and dice the population in any ways that seem to tell an interesting story. And, and one of the reasons I wrote the book around generations was I, I was seeing more and more generational uh, differences. You see more and more gender differences. You see more and more family structure differences. But overlaying it all is an increase in, in, in income and wealth inequality that is quite striking. It's striking across the full population. It's quite striking between groups, and it's quite striking within groups. It's just happening all over. And, and I do, I mean, listen, the genius of America for 200 plus years is that we are an enormously heterogeneous society. And, and we do, it seems to me, for warts and all, we do heterogeneity about as well as anybody. Witness the fact that we, we are opening our arms to immigration. I wish we could get a, a saner immigration policy. But by and large, that has all worked. But one of the things, one of the glues that makes this kind of uh, heterogeneous society work is a broad middle class with lots of on-ramps on, and there just seems to be less of that now. Uh, if someone's got a good answer to that question, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> Moving on from questions about trends and facts to questions about implications of these demographic changes. How do you see these demographic changes affecting the physical environment? And issues around urbanism, sprawl, and natural resource management? Well, I, at the end of the day, you know, a fewer people on the planet, you know, I, I would say is a good thing. I think most people would say is a good thing. And, you know, most demographers, starting with Malthus, uh, you know, the great worry has been population ex uh, explosion that would eventually devour the Earth's resources or in the, in the you know. Uh, when I was in college, uh, there was a, a book, I think it was by Paul Ehrlich, which was an international bestseller called The Population Bomb, and he said, basically, we're going to have mass starvation in the next decade. Hundreds of millions of people are going to die because we've already lost the battle to control uh, population growth. That was an alarmist view. It turned out not to be right. In the, 20, you know, the, in the 20th century, the world's population grew fourfold. In the 21st century that we're in, the best estimates are it will only grow another another 50% or so, and is likely, again, take all these long-term projections with a large grain of salt because things do change. But looking at, looking at the trends, the population of the world is now a little over 7 billion. It's likely to stabilize sometime or, uh, somewhere around 10 or 11 billion by the end of this century. This is, <coughs> this is almost entirely the story of declining birth rates. That's the story in part of some of the change in gender roles. For women, uh, now having a baby represents an economic cost that it didn't represent in the future, uh, uh, that didn't represent in the past. You go back to earlier times, people had a lot of kids because not all of them were going to survive and they wanted kids to take care of them in their old age and you now have 
state, state systems that take care of people in their old age. So there are a lot of reasons that people's calculations about family size have changed. And, and you know, I, what's not to like about that? What's not to like about stabilize, a stabilized population? What's not to like about longer lifespans? Uh, we, you know, uh, and there are some people who think we're just at the beginning. We're, you know, in 1900, uh, the lifespan at birth in the United States was 47. It's now 79. By the middle of the century, it'll be 84. And there are some people, there are scientists working in labs around the, around the world who think 84 is just the beginning, that there, there's no reason. You know, why do we have to die? You know, and, and they're, they're trying to invent Methuselah drugs. They're trying to invent computer chips to keep our cells going, just like a kind of an old jalopy that's got a good mechanic, and, and on and on we go. And again, we, we ask people a question uh, 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 about that in one of our surveys and say, look, if, if you could live to be 120 in reasonable health, would you want to? And do you think most people would want to? And the answer was, most people said, no, I wouldn't want to. And most people said, but most other people would want to. So uh, again, I, 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 don't know, I don't know where that's, where that's going. But, uh, but uh, I do think that uh, fewer, fewer, fewer people being born is a good thing, except, except we have fewer taxpayers to support us in our old age. What impact will these changes have on US foreign policy? Could the early stages of the change be partially responsible for the current US pullback from international involvement? No. Uh, I, I, whatever demographic challenges we have, uh, we, are, we are, I would say, demographically, and kinds of the things I've talked about, increased diversity and, and uh, the, the, the graying of our population, we are in far better shape than any of our major economic competitors. About 50 countries in the world are going to suffer population declines between now and mid-century. Led by, I, I mean, it seems to me the, the potential destabilizing force around these demographic changes is not a weakened U.S. If we get our policies right, we have every, we have every prospect of being as strong a nation, both domestically and internationally, as we've been. Uh, I would worry about uh, big, big countries, and Russia is one of them, that have a huge demographic problem. Uh, 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 th their life expectancy is going down, not up. Uh, and getting, uh, getting sort of mean-spirited and doing crazy things as a result. China has got an enormous problem. By the middle of this century, uh, China has got this HQ. It had the one-child policy, uh, so it's got all these upside-down family trees, uh, and, they, and they haven't had time to build a public safety net for their older folks. So what have you know, the question for China is, will it get old before it gets rich? What happens to, to all those older folks? And again, a lot of the older folks are in, in, in those small countryside villages, and their kids have now gone to the cities. And China has literally a call your mother law where, where, the, where the older folks can sue their kids, and some of them have, at least symbolically, for not calling and not sending money home. Um, Japan, you know, again, 30, 40 years ago, it was the Japan miracle. They were buying up all our real estate. They had the biggest banks. They had the coolest electronic gadgets. They were the, Japan is number one, was an international bestseller. <clears throat> Japan is now looking at a, uh, you know, at, at a debt to GDP ratio of 200% or more. A lot of reasons for that, but demographics is, is part of that story. Uh, and I guess the last, the last uh, thing that I would say is there are some people who posit as the world gets older, we will enjoy a geriatric peace that, <laughs> that, 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 that we, you know, we, we used to say, uh, you know, 40 years ago it was guns versus butter. Now it's guns versus canes, that we won't have the money or the energy to get into big fights with each other because we have to spend so much of our resources not building up our military but taking care of our older people. So maybe that's a blessing in disguise. Let me close uh, with a question inspired by the philosopher Yogi Berra, who noted that predictions are dangerous, especially about the future. Which of your predictions or hypotheses do you think is least likely to come true? Kind of thing. <laughs> well, here I'll tell you my own story about that, which is that uh, uh, I was—I used to be a newspaper reporter. I used to cover a lot of political campaigns, and I had a very bad habit of thinking I was pretty damn smart because I was out there talking to everybody, and I kind of knew what was likely to happen. And um, you know, in my best years, I was right about half the time. So, uh, <laughs> so what I would say in answer to that question is, if I, you know, if I knew which ones were wrong, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't make them. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I will say that. Look, uh, <laughs> one of the parts of the book that I think is fun, and one of the reasons I was willing to write a book 
you know, that does project forward to the middle of the, of the century is, in some ways, demography is the future we already know. You know, a lot of these numbers are already baked in. A lot of these kids have already been born. A lot, you know, the, the, the changing age shape is there. Uh, if you do demographic projections, you're, you're based on uh, mortality rates, fertility rates, and immigration rates. They all can change, particularly immigration rates can change because you can change public policies, and we've done that over the years. Mortality and fertility rates don't change that much. So on those, take those to the bank. Everything else, take with a grain of salt. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh... yeah, that concludes our program for this evening. On behalf of the World Affairs Council, thank you, Paul Taylor, for this excellent and informative discussion. Many thanks as well to you, the audience, for your terrific questions. Thank you again. Good night. Thank you.